Aloha. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Maintaining a Heart Healthy Lifestyle. My name is Dr. Kathleen Kozak, and I'm here to facilitate today's conversation. This Hawaii Pacific Health webinar event is focused on informing patients about identifying and understanding heart risk factors, preventative measures to support heart health, how COVID has impacted long-term heart conditions, and how to effectively support keiki with heart conditions. Before we get started, just a few reminders for our viewers. Today's webinar will be recorded. After the event is complete, registered participants will receive a copy of the recording. The event will also be available to view on our social media channels and website. For those joining us live, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can throughout the Q&A portion of the event. We are very lucky to have several experts joining us for today's discussion. Dr. Andreas Bretensack is a pediatric and adult congenital cardiologist working at HPH for the last nine years. He's an expert in interventional procedures and arrhythmias in the youth, and he has a passion for finding novel tools and techniques for improving the heart health of Hawaii's keiki. Dr. John Funai is an adult cardiologist at Kauai Medical Clinic and Wilcox Medical Center on Kauai and works in the prevention of heart disease and the management of a wide variety of adult heart conditions. Prior to working at HPH, he was an associate professor of medicine and biomedical engineering. Dr. Marty Taba is a family doctor who cares for people of all ages for the last 20 years at Straub Kailua. She has a passion for diabetes, proactive and preventative care, and collaboration with other physicians and partnering with patients to help them make the best decisions for their health. Thank you for joining us. Now, I'd like to get started with the topic of the last year or so. Everybody's concerned about COVID and what it can do long-term for people's health. You know, Dr. Taba, uh, how do COVID and heart disease tie into one another for adults? Well, when you get COVID, you can be mildly sick or you can be very sick. If you are very sick, it's kind of like running a marathon or charging up a bunch of stairs. It's, a, it's taxing to your heart. And so people who have some silent blockage or silent heart disease, it can manifest during times of stress. Well, that sounds like it doesn't really sound like something I want to get. I know that something that all of us want to have been trying our best to avoid. What about with children? Dr. Brattensack, can it affect the heart health of our keiki? Yes. Uh, luckily, uh, COVID doesn't affect kids too often. Last study showed that about 20% of infected kids have any kind of symptoms. But unfortunately, very rarely, COVID can cause a serious inflammation of the heart. And even if it's very rare, if it's your child, that's 100%. So even children with a rare occurrence of um, a heart-related issue with COVID should take care of themselves and try to avoid getting infected. Dr. Funai, what are the potential long-term effects of COVID on the heart? If you happen to have been diagnosed with this and you do wind up having a serious case that results in potentially needing to be hospitalized or even in the ICU, what does that do for your heart? The long-term effects of COVID on the heart are still being worked out. And here's what we know. Data are still pouring in and organization of the data is still ongoing. What is clear is that a, a large percentage of people who get COVID develop an inflammatory condition of the heart itself, probably due to the viral infection of the heart muscle. Now, how that expresses itself in the short and long run is still unclear. It is clear that a small percentage of people during the active COVID infection can develop massive heart failure, a result from the infection itself. And then there are other major consequences that go way beyond the heart that affect the heart in return, having to do with collapse of the circulation, serious malfunction of the, of the lungs and the kidney and the other endocrine and internal organs. But to your question, the question is, if I've had COVID now, what, and I get over it, what will happen to my heart in the long run? is very much unclear. And an interesting study that was done in Germany recently studied around 800 uh, professional athletes 
And, and the interest here was, are these highly trained and fit individuals going to develop heart problems? A minority of them, around 10, 15%, Ex ex who got COVID exhibited some minor malfunctions of the heart early on in terms of blood test abnormalities. All of them were then tested further with various kinds of imaging testing and studies of the heart, very sophisticated measurements. And the most sophisticated measurement was called a magnetic resonance image of the heart showed that the majority of them had inflammatory problems in the heart that did not exhibit itself in any kind of blood tests or symptoms. Now the study has only in its, it's, it's only being completed now, preliminary data were presented. The next stage of the study is to see what happens to them in the next six, 12 and 18, 24 months to see what percentage of them will develop more full blown problems of the heart, such as heart failure. And that's very unclear. We, we do not know what will happen to them. Uh, one final comment is that the American Heart Association recently recommended that people who have had COVID be watched carefully uh, on an average of three month intervals by a heart specialist and an internist, a family practitioner, watching for any manifestations of this problem in the heart. And there's actually an internal concern amongst cardiologists that we're going to see possibly a large percentage of people develop heart problems down the road as a result of this current infection. Well, now, if you have had a mild case of COVID, Dr. Taba, what sort of things can you do to help recondition yourself to get back into some of the activities that you might enjoy? I'm sure you've seen this with quite a few of your patients. What sort of things do you recommend that they do to get back into the routine? Well, first I tell them, depending how long they've been down or sick, it's gonna take about double the amount of time to get better. So not to get frustrated and not to get upset that you're not able to do what you were able to do right away. Um, but to be very deliberate about slowly restarting exercise and activity and not just sit on the couch because it does take effort and uh, a lot of motivation to get back to your previous level of um, activity. It doesn't just come back. You have to work at it. So we ask people to listen to their body. Don't push it, but also don't uh, be scared to do a little more activity every day as you can. Step by step, little by little. All mm -hmm. right. Well, we do know that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of both men and women in the United States. Some of the risk factors or things we're familiar with uh, Dr. Bratensack, I'd like to hear about what are some of the earliest ways that people might have a risk, particularly starting maybe in their youth. Yes, um, I think it's very important to understand that uh, the adult kind of heart disease starts very early on. It really starts in your 20s and 30s. And when it starts in your 20s and 30s, that's because of the lifestyle that you have from the very beginning, even in your adolescent life, or even before when you are five and six years old, that's when you learn certain um, behaviors, you learn to be active, you learn to be sedentary, that's when you develop your taste, your diet, so to say, it's really affected by your family. And that's a family tradition then that we will get with you along your life. So I think it's very important to understand that this can be set straight or be, can be derailed at very early on. If you have a good example for, for your children doing and having an active lifestyle, having exercise every single day and have a very well balanced, so to say colorful diet. A lot of times I tell to my families, if you look at your plate, it should have all the colors on it. And then maybe half of your plate should be vegetables and French fries doesn't count as a vegetable at that point. So if you, you know, put together a nice healthy diet with lots of veggies and all kinds of colors and exercise every day, that sets you in the right direction. So I truly believe it starts early on when you are a little kid. Well, let's say that maybe you had a good upbringing, but you now are in your 20s, maybe your 30s. Uh, Dr. Taba, what sort of things should people do to really be proactive to prevent developing heart disease as they get older? So uh, again, Dr. Bracken said, hit the nail on the head when we said making those daily choices. It seems like it's just so easy to go through the drive-through. It's so easy to pick up something and you 
you end up doing it day after day. You end up doing it three, four times a week. And that builds up over time. You won't feel it right away, but those habits will predispose you to obesity. It'll predispose you to high blood pressure. All these things that become more of a risk for your heart. Um, I agree with the colorful diet, the veggies, the homemade food, the home cooked foods, uh, trying to minimize an excess on anything in particular, which includes French fries and brownies and just trying to do everything in moderation. Uh, it's not that you're never gonna have brownies but or never gonna have pizza, but majority of the time, try and eat fruits and vegetables and you know whole grains like oatmeal um, and really try and save some of those treats and those special uh, sinful foods for special occasions. Um, you have to build this as part of your lifestyle, your daily habits, your 90% of the time, how are you gonna eat? You're gonna eat leftovers from home. You're gonna cook. I, I end up, I'm a working mom, so I cook all weekends so that we um, heat up during the week. My husband is a excellent microwaver and uh, he will help to, so that we have home cooked food during the week. It would be so much easier to pick up from a local restaurant but that's not gonna be healthier for me or my kids. Uh, when my kids were three uh, and they didn't like broccoli, that's all they got for dinner. After they finished their broccoli, <laughs> they could have their something else, right? And uh, my other son didn't like his chicken. So he had to sit in front of his chicken and my son had to sit in front of his broccoli. They're, when they're hungry, they'll eat it. After a while, we didn't have to tell them you have to eat broccoli first. They just knew that's what the rule was and they just did it. And uh, it's important that I offered broccoli or some kind of vegetable every night for dinner. Otherwise they were happy to get away with it. So um, again, just making these habits and rules of the family are the way to build. And, and if you're the mom or the dad or the, you know, you're gonna have to instill these habits. You should not be eating only rice and <laughs> meat on your plate. You, uh, it will never stick. The kids will never follow rules that you're not doing. So you're gonna have to make food for the whole family and food that you're gonna eat. I tell my patients, don't have difficulties with veggies. They can be expensive fresh veggies. So try and grow some or get frozen vegetables. It's easy, quick, it doesn't spoil and it is much healthier. Well, now, in the perfect world, all of us are going to follow all the colorful diets. And Marty, I'm going to come to your house and you can force me mm -hmm. to eat broccoli. That's my favorite. I'll serve you broccoli. Yeah. Uh, I will eat that first. <laughs> I, now, sometimes despite all that, you still develop some problems with heart issues. Dr. Funai, what are the most common risk factors that you see in the patients that you have determined they have cardiovascular disease? What sort of risk factors do they have and how can we help to mitigate some of that before it gets to the point where it's time to do interventions? Yes, there are a number of risk factors that I see regularly, uh, but before I get into them, I will point out that there are people who do everything perfectly and still get the condition. And so it is a, almost a genetically programmed potential that we possess, human beings do, which are uh, with potentials amplified by these risk factors, uh, which I'll be mentioning in a moment. And they are powerful risk factors. Uh, so we, we work hard because uh, we have a propensity to develop coronary heart disease. Uh, and they are provoked by the following conditions. One is aging. As I get older, the potential to develop it continues to rise even into my 90s. Uh, indeed, if you look at surveys of conditions of, the, of people in their 80s and 90s, the incidence of heart conditions keeps rising uh, into the older ages. High blood pressure is the most common, important, and modifiable condition that leads to heart disease. And it is said amongst cardiologists and internists that is, it is one of the most powerful effectors of heart disease. Lowering high blood pressure has a profound effect on this potential to develop the disease. That's why uh, doctors harp on this. They talk about it so often. Nurses and doctors talk about it, measure it. Uh, it's a common source of uh, conversation because it is so powerful. A third is high blood, high cholesterol. 
or hyperlipidemia. Uh, high cholesterol is both determined by genetic predisposition as well as diet and activity. If I am prone to developing it because I've inherited the, the trait from my parents and grandparents, and I am inactive, and I'm eating carelessly, large amounts, especially of high fat foods, the higher my cholesterol will be. Reversing that uh, condition takes a great deal of work and attention. And that means higher levels of activity, exercise, eating less food in general, lowering calorie content, lowering the amount of fat in my diet, and, and being careful, uh, being watchful of myself. And finally, taking medicines to lower my cholesterol, uh, which as you may be aware, are statins are the most popular, most effective. Third is diabetes mellitus, high blood sugar, which uh, causes the sugar levels in the body to rise, which leads to uh, elevations of cholesterol, which tends to cause blood pressures to rise, but has its own direct effect on, this, on the blood vessels and the organs of the body, which leads to a, a chronic inflammatory state, which is known as atherosclerosis. Fourth is cigarette smoking. Tobacco smoking is an extremely powerful cause of heart disease. Uh, stopping smoking alone can in many people stop or prevent the condition from progressing or developing in the first place. And fortunately, our society has taken great pains over the last 40, 50 years to, to curtail this. Uh, finally, physical inactivity, a sedentary life that uh, where exercise is not a regular part of the daily activities um, has a very powerful effect. Uh, however, as we all understand, uh, con combating that is extraordinarily hard with our busy lives and high tension schedules and, and all of our energies going into our work and our families, the time to go and exercise is, is limited, and, but we have to program it into our lives in order for it to be a part of us. Uh, those are the principal main important risk factors that lead to heart disease, all modifiable except for my genetic predisposition. And age. We're stuck with age. And age. John. And age. <laughs> We're all getting older, Marty. I think we I probably around the same time. And that was two decades ago. Now, I'm curious because there's a lot of work that you do in your office as a primary care doctor to try and prevent people from developing heart disease, from needing to see a cardiologist like Dr. Funai. And you often receive patients who have had pediatric issues that Dr. Brattensack might have been able to help them with, with their heart. There's a common thought that once you get medications to control certain conditions that you've cured them and maybe, maybe that's it, you don't need those pills anymore. What sort of things do you say to people to make sure that they understand the process of why medications are needed and when they can be adjusted and when they really can't be? So it's interesting that a lot of my patients, as I go through what kind of medical conditions they have, they actually argue with me that they don't have high cholesterol anymore because they, the medicine lowered the number, right? Or they don't have high blood pressure anymore, even if they're taking two medications. And I always respond to them that they have high blood pressure. It's now well controlled right? And so if you decide to stop the treatment, it's going to go back to its original state. And the problem is you aren't going to feel it. You're not going to feel your high blood pressure almost always. You're not going to feel high cholesterol. And a lot of times you can't feel your high sugar either, but it's silently doing damage. And uh, we've noticed, I've noticed in the pandemic, many people didn't come to the office. And even though they had a blood pressure cuff at home, they didn't pull it out. And when they came to the office finally, and we saw their blood pressure, they had no idea they had gained weight. Uh, and they had no idea that they, their blood pressure was high. And why? It's because something changed in their routine that they were unaware of. Sometimes they forgot to refill their medicine. Uh, you know, which is, again, very dangerous because you really don't realize that your blood pressure is high. Sometimes they were exercising and then COVID shut the gym down and then they stopped exercising. You know, exercise is almost like having an additional blood pressure medicine. So when they stopped exercising, the blood pressure rose. They had no idea, right? And so it's 
important for your health, your heart health and your overall health, to be monitoring the conditions that you have and making sure that they are in well control. That means going to your doctor regularly, getting your blood work done regularly, checking your blood pressure regularly, checking your weight regularly. You know, uh, when we have elastic pants, we can't tell if we gained weight or not. And, uh, but that has a, a profound impact on your other medical problems. I'd like to amplify what Marty just said about not feeling your blood pressure. Uh, I, I run into this issue frequently where a person will tell me, you know, uh, when I feel my high blood pressure, I'll take my pressure. And you know what? It's high. That's why I know I'm pressures are high. So I've asked this person to check his or her blood pressure randomly when that even not when they feel it. And you know what? It turns out it's always high. <laughs> so the presumption that you feel pressure is, is quite a, a common uh, thought and feeling. And I would like to amplify it one more time. Until around 1960, there was no condition called high blood pressure. Uh, it was believed to be normal. And in fact, uh, what we find is that the natural history of blood pressure as we age is that it rises and it rises steadily with age. In fact, until the early 60s, there was a so-called nomogram that we used to decide what a pressure ought to be for a person. And what it was, was 100 plus your age in years. And that was your expected blood pressure. So if I were a 30-year-old guy, you'd say 130. If I was an 80-year-old person, you'd say 100 plus 80, 180. And you know what? It was true. It worked out perfectly. Because as it turns out, pressures rise with age, and they don't tend to go down in many people. Sometimes they do. Uh, so blood pressures rise with age and people feel perfectly normal until many years later after the accumulated injury to the blood and circulation, the organs, that they begin to feel it. So there's no feeling of high blood pressure. It only can be figured out by putting a cuff on. Thanks for your attention to that. Kathy, real quick, I wanted to add that some people say, you mean I'm going to be on these medicines forever, right? And sometimes, unfortunately, you have to. There's a bad, you know, strong genetic component or something. You've had already a heart attack. We want to prevent at all costs another one. But sometimes you can potentially, working closely with your physician, be able to reduce medicine if there's a significant change in your lifestyle. So if you've adopted the regular exercise Dr. Brackensack talks about, if you lost 20 or 30 pounds or, you know, even 15, it can make you in remission to one of your medical problems. I say it's never gone away because if you gain that 15 pounds back, your blood pressure will come back, you know, your diabetes will come back. But there is a way sometimes to be able to go in remission. If Kathy, if I may jump on that, um, just wanted to just um, reiterate what Dr. Tabo said. A lot of times when I see adolescents with high blood pressure, I give them the chance. I can prescribe you a medication, but this is really what you want at 16 years of age, mm. or I can prescribe you something else that I think you can do. And they are like, okay, what is the else that you can prescribe me? And I said, 60 minute exercise per day, including the weekends. And I said, is that true? And a lot of times it works, excellent. If you truly exercise, and exercise doesn't count at 16 years of age taking your dog out. That's not exercise. <laughs> exercise when you break a sweat. So you do have to exercise every single day. And that takes a giant effect on a lot of things, including blood pressure, including heart disease. Well, we do have a lot of pediatric services that are available through HPH. Dr. Bratensack, what are some of those services? Um, we have a comprehensive set of services here for kids. Uh, we have currently four pediatric cardiologists working at Capulani, an intensive care unit, inpatient and outpatient services. We can take pictures of your heart. We can do EKGs. It monitors the rhythm of your heart. So we are able to take care of any um, patient, any children, with a congenital or even an acquired heart disease. If they have a symptoms of chest pain, they have exercise intolerance, they have problems in their youth sport, or if they have palpitations, or even if they have COVID-related problems with their heart. Um, but 
beyond what we can do as an outpatient uh, physician, what is I would like to emphasize that is we are expanding these um, um, uh, services. We are going to improve our care by hiring a heart surgeon and they're getting a cardiac cath lab in Capulani, which will be able to provide services in Capulani to the children of Hawaii that currently we are unable to do. We are sending so many children out to the mainland for specialized care. And what we are planning to do here in Capulani and Hawaii Pacific Health, we are going to create the first comprehensive congenital heart center. So this is going to happen throughout 2021, this year and 2022. And hopefully we'll have um, the complete palette of services available for everybody in Hawaii. Well, that sounds like a big mission and I'm really happy to know that we'll have the ability to take such great care of our keiki here in the islands. Dr. Funai, what sort of services do we have for adults for cardiology? For the adults in Hawaii, uh, HPH provides a very broad uh, set of services in cardiology, uh, ranging from heart surgery uh, through uh, angioplasty services, electrophysiology services, which I'll amplify in a moment, and, and now with Andreas's help, uh, congenital heart disease in adults. Uh, of interest here is we've just hired two additional cardiac surgeons, adult cardiac surgeons, both from Harvard, who have joined our, our current and long-standing cardiac surgeon, Dr. Mark Grattan. Uh, this is a, t a husband and wife team who have joined us uh, together, both trained and were on staff at Mass General Hospital. Uh, we've also launched in the last year and a half what's called a structural heart program, which as some of people may be uh, aware of, uh, a structural heart program is a very specialized, modern, new type of therapy for the heart in adults and in children, where we can repair many conditions of the heart with catheters. Uh, uh, the best example I can give you is a procedure called TAVR, T-A-V-R, which stands for transcatheter aortic valve repair. Uh, if I present it to you as an older person with a common condition of my heart, called aortic stenosis, where one of the heart valves gets tight and begins to obstruct the outflow of my heart to the body, this condition until a few years ago was treatable only by surgery, open heart surgery, to remove the old valve and to sew a new valve in. A very big surgery, typically for older people, a very tough situation for most people. What was designed and developed in the US and finally approved by the FDA four years ago is a procedure where we can now put a catheter into the circulation, into the heart through the tight valve and open the valve with a balloon device. Once the valve is opened, then a new balloon can be put in through that same valve intravenously to then implant a new valve inside of the old valve. This new valve is expandable it's built, built on an expandable stent, which is about the size of a golf ball in diameter. And inside of it are the leaflets of a new, brand new valve. This procedure literally takes about an hour. Uh, the stay in hospital time is usually just overnight uh, as compared to a massive open heart surgery with all of the attendant risks and dangers and suffering, uh, whereas uh, this can be done very quickly and people are back home the next day, literally. Uh, this has revolutionized the treatment of this condition, which is very frequent in older people. And it is being now used throughout the United States since it was approved. Uh, we now have two structural heart disease specialists who are fully fledged in doing this and are busily at work, even probably right now doing them. Uh, they are Dr. Jared Oyama, and Dr. Reiji Tsutsui, both superb cardiologists, and they are being fed by our system, finding these conditions and feeding them into the system. And I have many people back here on Kauai who've had this treatment. There are numerous other treatments in this structural heart program involving catheter devices to fix conditions in the heart, uh, particularly the valves uh, without surgery. Our electrophysiology service for adult are getting bigger and bigger. These are specialists in cardiology who 
are frequently implanting uh, pacemakers or uh, devices called defibrillators and doing a procedure that many people are familiar with is called catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we recently also hired a specialist in congestive heart failure, uh, Dr. Carol Lai, who's at Straub, who is a specialist in congestive heart failure, a very common, frequent problem of adults who have had heart disease and develop weakness of the heart and all of the problems of that. A very uh, uh, important uh, uh, specialty within our division. And we're hooked up together by this, uh, this system called EPIC that makes all of our data, all of our pictures, all of our notes interchangeable and, and uh, shared by everyone. Uh, finally, I'd like to say that we have a program at Straub called Ornish, the Ornish program, which involves cardiac rehab and exercise, and the Ornish diet, which is a, uh, I believe it's a lacto-ovo vegetable diet. It's a low-fat vegetable-based diet, and the program is going full blast right now, even during COVID. Well, it sounds like we have a really good entire cardiac situation where you can be entering in the system as a child and have comprehensive care throughout the extent of your lifetime. The other area that I know that HPH has put a lot of emphasis on is primary care. So Marty, as you think about people who come to see you in your office, when they come in and they say, Dr. Taba, I've had some concerns, I'm afraid that I may have heart disease. What sort of symptoms do you take care of and how would you evaluate somebody in your office in that situation? When would they need someone like Dr. Funai? So usually uh, if it, they're not actively having severe chest pain at the moment, which you should go to 911 or go to the ER and do not drive yourself. Um, if we're talking about somebody who has often on chest pain, there's a lot of factors and a lot of causes of chest pain. Some are heart related, some are not. And so it's important for me to have time to tease that out with the patients. Um, a real red flag for me is a change in their exercise tolerance. So if they were always walking the beach on Kailua and all of a sudden they get tired faster or they get winded faster, they may or may not have chest pain. That is a very, very much of a red flag. Anyone who experiences that should contact their personal physician with those symptoms. Um, Chest pain, if it sounds like it could be cardiac, usually we'll do some kind of a stress test to see if there is any evidence of blockage in the heart that could cause a heart attack down the road. And, uh, and then if we feel they need further investigation or discussion with a cardiologist, we will refer at that point. But not all chest pain is cardiac chest pain. So usually it's good to start with your personal physician. So start with your primary care doctor if you're not having active chest pain symptoms, because if you are, you want to make sure you get taken care of immediately. So if you saw someone in your office, Dr. Taba, and you did a stress test and you felt that they needed further investigation, you might send them to someone like Dr. Funai. Uh, Dr. Funai, what would be the next step when they saw you? So you have this patient in your office. They have some of the risk factors. They might be on all the right medications. They might be on blood pressure medicine, cholesterol medicine, their diabetes might be good, but they're still experiencing symptoms and their stress test shows that there could be troubles. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to talk very carefully about what the possibilities are based on the data so far, including those risk factors you mentioned, the symptoms, which are extremely important, because we will not start with there are no symptoms. Sometimes there are conditions that go symptom-free, but not commonly. And the test results themselves, the details of how the test was done and what they showed. We go through then a process of uh, listing the possibilities by order of importance and severity down from top to bottom, and usually then settle on if it's sufficiently strong to recommend that there is something going on in the heart that's serious, uh, then further studies beyond the stress test. But I must emphasize how a person feels, whether they're feeling a discomfort or a difficulty exercising is critical. Uh, if I'm feeling well, the likelihood of having significant heart disease is quite low. It's not zero 
because there are exceptions. You've heard stories about Uncle Joe who felt perfectly fine and went to the doctor and had a test and there it was. Suddenly they found it and why don't I get the test too because I feel well and I don't know if I have it too. That circumstance is not common. It's a, it, everybody knows that case, but that doesn't happen very often. You know, what is much more important is how the person feels. Uh, I wanna just make a little quip and that is often I'll walk into my clinic exam room and ask someone how they are. And they'll tell me, well, doc, tell me how you think I am. And I go, well, actually, it depends on how you're feeling. Uh, if you're feeling well, that gives me a very different approach to how we're doing. And if you're feeling poorly, a, a concurrently, a very different approach. Uh, the next step after a positive stress test, if it's indicated, is to consider doing a much more invasive test than a treadmill test to find out if this test indicates truly that there is a blockage in the heart. Uh, and if there is a blockage found by a heart angiogram, then we have a whole series of protocols to follow as to whether this blockage should be opened, how it should be opened, and what else should be done to make sure that it's safe thereafter for the person so that they do not have another blockage develop again. But the symptoms are critical. Uh, they, we cannot go on without knowing how a person feels. And so how a person feels matters hugely. Well, and I think that certainly says a lot for the possibility of needing to do further testing. This is where people hear about angioplasties or stents or a variety of different cardiac procedures, and even where bypass comes into the situation. You mentioned the cardiac surgeons that have recently joined us at Hawaii Pacific Health, and those would be the folks that might get called if the symptoms are serious enough and your testing is serious enough to suggest that they may need even a bigger intervention. Correct. So it sounds like if we start from when we're young, Dr. Bratton Sack, and we get good, healthy habits as a youth, that that may translate to when we're older, we see somebody like Dr. Taba, we keep those conditions under good control, blood pressure, cholesterol, sugars, not smoking. And then unfortunately, we might be able to avoid you, Dr. Funai. Not <laughs> good. Like that is a good thing want to have cardiovascular disease. Now we had a couple of questions come into the chat and we have a few moments to go over those. One of those was very interesting. Dr. Bratton Sack, someone mentioned that um, they had some uncles who had aneurysms of the aorta. Is that a hereditary condition? Can children get those sorts of things? Yes, it can be. Um, aneurysms of the aorta, meaning an enlargement of the aorta, the big blast vessel that comes out of the heart. And the uh, serious thing about it, it can burst open. And when it bursts open, usually you don't tell the next day. Uh, it's a fatal outcome. And yes, it can be hereditary. And in everybody who has a family member who has an aortic aneurysm or an enlarged aorta, I think they ought to be screened and they ought to be screened uh, family members with potential genetic screening and imaging that we have it available, echocardiogram and ultrasound. And if it diagnoses that certain condition, whether because it's a genetic trait or it's a condition that you see in a child, it needs to be treated and should be treated. Um, that brings me to another point that uh, can be related to the question that can heart disease be genetic and can be inherited? And if somebody has an early onset heart disease, can that be identified in the children? And the truth is that yes, some uh, sort or some to some degree, heart disease can be genetic or genetic factors can lead to the earlier development of heart disease. Well, let me take a point here, which is important. Did you know that the life expectancy of our children right now is for the first time in human history is shorter than any previous life, ex or life expectancy mm. of the previous generation? And I think this matters a lot. That it's not because suddenly we are full of genetic disease for the heart, it's because of our lifestyle. So yes, genetic things can be inherited and can affect heart disease, but I think the most important is our lifestyle. So even if you are listening in, not only for yourself, but you have kids or grandkids, do something for your keiki and have them run around as much as possible and have them eat a healthier diet so that you don't get that much 
uh, heart disease and you can fight even if you have a genetic predisposition. Really quick on the um, aneurysm question, I would say that please talk to your primary care physician about your family history. That's really important to help them help you screen if you're at risk or not. There are a lot of um, factors for an aneurysm that may not be genetic, but more lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fana, you mentioned the Ornish program earlier, and one of the folks in the chat asked a question about the Ornish program and the positive impact of omega-3 fatty acids on heart health. A lot of times certain programs that follow certain dietary restrictions don't allow for people to take in the types of fish and other things that might have omega-3s. What is the current feeling amongst cardiologists about omega-3? The story of an omega-3s is a long one. Briefly in the 1970s, studies in Northern Europe, in Finland and uh, uh, Sweden, focusing on people who were eating huge amounts of fish, including fish oil, were studied and compared to other Northern Europeans who were not. And they showed uh, fairly uh, convincingly that a high intake of fish oil led to less heart disease. Uh, this, these studies became hallmarks so that subsequent generations followed them carefully, heavily. Uh, as a result of that, however, and the uh, introduction of evidence-based medicine in the 1970s and 80s, more and more careful studies were done to verify with whether this is true. And I have to tell you that over the last 20, 25 years, Increasingly more studies have shown that this is true, but much to a much lesser degree than was originally believed. Uh, but there is truth in this matter. And that is that a fish oil, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, do seem to have a protective action on the heart and circulation. How they do is not at all understood. We have some clues, but it's not well understood. Partly it may be due to raising HDL, the good cholesterol, and part of it may be due to lowering the so-called bad cholesterol but there may be a protective effect inherent in fish oil. Of interest in this area is that in the last several years, one component of fish oil has been isolated to become probably the key substance in fish oil that is protected. And it's called icosapentethyl, uh, which is a component of fish oil, which is not a single entity. There are numerous oil parts of it. And this has been isolated and found to be very powerful at lowering bad cholesterol and possibly raising good cholesterol. And it is now have been su sufficiently studied that it's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the use in, in helping to modify cholesterol levels, especially in people with established heart disease. And it goes by a trade name uh, that we use. Uh, so fish oil is still strongly recommended, but not as strongly as maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, it's possible that the fish oil that comes out of the local uh, grocery store or a drugstore may not be as effective as the specific component called icosapentethyl, um, and that is only available by prescription. It turns out that it is a very small, tiny component of the whole fish oil, so you have to drink literally liters, gallons of fish oil to get the same effect. Uh, I, I don't dissuade anyone from taking fish oil, but I, I do recommend that they understand how uh, not as powerful it is as they believed it was, and we, as we all believed it was once. Well, that gets me to coming to Dr. Taba's house. I'm going to stick <laughs> to broccoli instead of gallons of fish oil. All right, I want to thank each of you for joining us today, and thank you so much to our panelists. They took the time today to provide insights for our viewers and patients watching at home. We hope you're able to take away some helpful information to help you focus on your heart health moving forward. As you have heard throughout today's program, Hawaii Pacific Health offers comprehensive services that can help support the medical needs of you and your family from virtual care via video and phone or in-person visits, all different specialties. We are here to help keep you healthier throughout your lifetime. If you have any questions regarding our services on today's webinar, please visit hawaiipacifichealth.org. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you stay safe and healthy. Good night.